just evaluating us. Today, our lesson is on how well are you receiving the word? How well are you personally receiving, accepting what the Bible says? Our text for this morning is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 to 16. May I remind you that the Thessalonians came to know, came to be, became Christians in a very short time. Paul only was with them for three Sabbaths. That was it. And then he had to leave town. They were beating up Christians by that time. The Christians said, who had just accepted Christ. I mean, we're talking baby, baby, baby. They were more baby than you were baby when you came here, Dylan. Okay. These, these were really babies. They, just within the last couple of weeks, they'd made commitments to Christ. They're getting beat up because they've made commitments to Christ and gotten baptized. And, so, and now they're sending Paul out of town because they don't want Paul to get killed. Paul, Silas, Timothy leave after just three Sabbath. That's not even probably a total of three weeks that they've been there talking to the people, teaching the people, sharing Jesus with them. They have faced severe persecution as young believers. And that hostility continues to, that, and, and will continue to, to rip apart the, the Christian church there that's, that's barely gotten started. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we also thank God, verse 13, we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit and the wrath of God has come upon them at last. May God... Help us to understand and apply his living word. How can you tell whether a church is a true church? A church that really um, is honoring Jesus Christ? It's going to be one that receives the word of God, like the Thessalonians, that honors the saints, in other words, that that they actually start living, imitating others who are following Jesus Christ, and they had learn how to endure difficulties, suffering, even persecution. Look at how the Thessalonians received the word. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as that actually is the word of God, which indeed is at work in you who believe. They welcomed. They didn't just say, oh yeah, okay, well that's interesting. Oh, that's it's nice sounding. They welcomed what had been preached to them, what had been taught to them. They welcomed it as the very word of God. They understood, this is not from man. This is from God himself. And they accepted it. In fact, Matthew 24, verse 35 says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Jesus' words are still available to us today, aren't they? We've been reading from it. We're going to read several other passages this morning. 1 Peter 1, 23 to 25 says, For you have been born again. There's that phrase. You have a new relationship with Jesus Christ. You've been born into something brand new. You've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. How do people come to know Jesus? Through the word of God through the living word of God. For all people are like grass. All their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And Peter goes on to say, and this is the word that was preached to you. How do you know when you have received and are receiving the word of God? 
you personally. How do you know when you're receiving the word of God? I would say that you'll know that when you're applying what the word of God says. So if the, wa- if the word of God says, love your neighbor, will you know if you've received the word because you said, oh yeah, that was really a great word. I really like that. No, that's not when you're going to know whether you received it. We're going to know when you received it when you go do it, when you apply it. Our life groups, the the heart of what our life groups are about, our small groups, is about you connecting with other Christians who are going to help you apply the word of God. The questions we ask in our life groups, including our youth group, our cultivate group, are all questions meant to help you apply the word of God to your life. How, most people, when they listen to a sermon, you know what happens? Most people listen to the sermon, go out the door, and forget what they just heard. Come on, be honest, right? Some of you already forgot my opening lines, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> we, we forget things. We kind of just move on. And, 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 and yet we've sat there, we say, yeah, I've listened, I've heard, I'm going to do that. But it's, we haven't applied it. We haven't lived it. We haven't welcomed it. We haven't received it until we do it. Thank you. I was hoping somebody would say that. (laughs) Look at what the Word of God does for us. Uh, Just just think about this for a few minutes. I'm going to go through kind of a list of things that the Word of God does for us. First off, the Word blesses us. Luke 11, 28 says, Blessed is the one who hears the Word of God and obeys it. Oh, look at that. Blessed is the one, he he doesn't just say who hears it, but he says, blessed is the one who hears it and what? Obeys it. That's his work in us. It teaches us. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching. We kind of would like him maybe stop there, except that look at what he goes on to say. For reproof, uh uh-oh, for correction, for training in righteousness until the person of God, the man of God, is perfect, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The word of God blesses us, even if we're getting corrected by it, even if we're getting trained by it. The word of God blesses us. Secondly, the word of God guides us. Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light to my path. It shines the way. It points direction. It tells me what school I ought to go to. It's going to counsel me on what gifts I have. The Word of God actually wants to guide me through my life. (coughs) How many of you use Google Maps? This is a test right now. Raise your hand if you use Google Maps. Oh, more than I thought. Okay, how many of you are Wazers? You use Waze. W-A-Z-E. Come on, put the hands up. Be proud of it. Thank you, dear. <laughs> okay, so Google Maps outshines uh, ways, but, <laughs> but you, what is it? You're using a tool to find where you should go, aren't you? And you're trusting that lady that's, that, you know, like Leslie talks about, the lady, lady that talks in her phone that's going to tell her where to go. Don't you trust that when you look at those maps, you, you give the directions? By the way, has anyone ever missed getting where you're supposed to be because you were listening? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes they're a little bit off. Or some of us know better. Okay, yes, it says to go here, here, and here, but oh, no. <laughs> you're never going to make it that way. The other day I was told I was trying to find a place. Uh, I was down visiting Virgil Stowe, and I was trying to get to um, Panera Bread. And so it gave me very, really simple directions. The only problem was it wanted me to turn right on a one-way road. <laughs> now what do you do? You know, Google Maps doesn't do redirecting. <laughs> but, so, but, uh, yeah, so then you've got to find your own way around. Or, or here's the other bad one is, what happens if your map doesn't turn over? And, and you're, you're heading south, right? And only, only the map's still looking like you're going the other direction. And that can be really confusing too. So was that a right or a left? And I can't hear what she's saying. And so you can really get messed up. But, but maps are meant to guide us, aren't they? And the word of God is meant to be a guide for our lives. Third thing, Psalm 119, 24. This one I specifically selected for Dylan. The the word counsels us. Thy testimonies also are my delight. They are my 
counselors. Or Psalm 119, 54 says, Revive me according to thy word. So Colossians 1 says, The word of truth which has come to you is, instant, is constantly bearing fruit. The word of God counsels me. I love, what did we learn about? We learned that the Holy Spirit is the one who comes alongside of us, our helper, our advocate, our counselor. And the Word of God is a tool to counsel us. We, we go to it when we're hurting. We go to it when we need direction. We go to it when we're afraid. We go to it when we're concerned. There's valuable tools there for us to bless other people with the Word of God. It counsels us. Here's another one. The Word of God works in us. This is one you're going to really look forward to. Okay? Are you ready for it? The Word of God works in us to judge us. Isn't that a good one? It does. It judges us. Hebrews 4.12 says, It pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrows, and is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The living, powerful Word of God can look into your heart and examine you, and, and because of that, can correct you and can direct you about things that are going on inside. And in that process, uh, the, the John 17 says, Jesus prayed, sanctify them by thy truth, for thy word is truth. As the word literally judges us inside, it actually starts to then cleanse us. In fact, John 15, 3, we are cleansed by the word. One of my favorite ones, to be honest now, is the, the next one. The word of God sets us free. The word of God sets us free. John 8 says, the truth shall make you free. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, leading you, is another passage I have, that leading you to all wisdom, teaching, admonishing, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, thanksgiving. The word of God, you shall know the truth, and the truth the truth shall set you free. As you get to know the word of God, it sets you free. And how about this one? The word gives us joy. 1 John 1, 4 says, we write this to make our joy complete. John was actually writing the words down, writing the Bible, and he says, as I'm writing this, it's making my joy complete. As I'm sharing this with you, or Matthew 13, 20, the seed fall falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it, how? With joy. This is the parable of the sower, or the parable of the seeds, or the parable of the soils, whichever label you want to give to it, in which Jesus is saying, that the, the word of God is the seed. The seed gets thrown out on all different kinds of ground. There's the rocky ground, there's the pathway, there's the place with the weeds, and then there's the fertile ground. And then actually in looking at that, what's Jesus saying? He says, all of us may have those different soils in our heart, don't we? Or all of us may be one of those soils. We may be a soil where the seed goes down and the sun scorches it immediately. We may be see, have, have a heart where the, the word comes in, the seed is, is planted, we grow up really, really fast, only, only it gets scorched as well. We may be a seed that gets choked off by the weeds that we've got in our life, all the things that are just keeping us away from God. Or we may be that soil that says, yes, God, grow in me and give forth a harvest. The word, though, gives us joy, it says. Psalm 119.11 says that the word protects us. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Or Psalm 119, verse 28, my soul weeps because of grief. Strengthen me according to your word. The word of God protects us even from our sin nature. The word of God protects us from, from difficulties and pain. And then the word makes us wise. Psalm 119, and if you've noticed, I've done several quotes from Psalm 119. Does anybody know how long Psalm 119 is? It's the longest psalm, the long, right, in the, in the Bible, and over 170-some verses, and it's broken up. Do you know how the psalm is broken up? It's broken up alphabetically by the Hebrew. If you want to, by the way, for most Bibles, you can actually go learn the Hebrew alphabet by reading Psalm 119, because every section is a different alphabet uh, of the Hebrew language, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, they write down in, in order. And you can, and now what's really cool is if you could read Hebrew, did you know that every verse in each section begins with that letter? 
That's crazy. <laughs> that this psalm, with each of them having about 10, six to, six to 10 verses in it, every phrase in there begins with the letter, uh, the, the word begins with the letter of that section. And it's what is Psalm 119 all about? The word of God. The word makes us wise. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. The commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, because I have observed your precepts. The word of God makes us wise. That was Psalm 119, 97 to 100. The very first psalm, Psalm 1, says that the word of God makes us successful. Uh, you may want to use another word. You'll see it. It's the word prosperous. It, it makes us successful. Verses 1 through 3. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, what? Prospers. Joshua said it this way in verses chapter 1, verses 8 and, 9, 8 and 9. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it, Joshua, day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. You see, success comes by us listening and obeying the word of God. And I guess the last one on my list, and I'm sure that you could make a much more exhaustive one, but the last one is the Word of God gives us hope. Yesterday when we said goodbye to a 65-year-old man uh, who actually died eight years ago, um, was dead in the ambulance on the way down to the hospital. They were able to bring him back. And... Um, when they um, brought him back, the doctor said, uh, okay, well, he's probably going to be a vegetable uh, because he was um, literally dead for so long. And, um, and, and in coming back, he said, I couldn't decide what vegetable to be, so I had to come back. <laughs> the word gives us hope. Psalm 119, I'm going to read now several verses. Verse 43, never take your word of truth from my mouth, for I have put my hope in your laws. Verse 49, remember your word to your servant, for you have given me hope. Verse 74, may those who fear you rejoice when they see me, for I have put my hope in your word. Verse 81, my soul faints with longing for your salvation, but I have put my hope in your word. Verse 114, you are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. 147, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I have put my hope in your word. Or move on to another Psalm 130, verse 5. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. Or Psalm 15, verse 4, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. The word of God gives us hope. That's, that's what was carrying you the other day in the hospital. Even when that surgeon tried to give you more bad news before Trisha went in to surgery. God wanted to give you hope with his word. That's what gives you hope to carry on, to have this little baby. You don't know all the what may happen. We know she's going to be special. And it's the word of God that gives us hope. How can you do a funeral? It's one of the hardest things in some ways to do. 
to, and especially if you are doing a funeral for people, somebody you don't know. And how do you deal with somebody who says, well, oh, I'm sure they're good, so they're going to end up in heaven. You know, and the challenge is, uh, do a funeral for a child or a teenager, young person. Oh, my. Uh, we love Timmy. He's a pain at times. <laughs> <laughs> but we love him. And, and we would have been brokenhearted if Timmy had died yesterday. And if we had to do his service, his funeral here, it would be, it would be emotional. It, it would be crushing for all of us, um, for any of us who knew him, and, and for any of us who know Tanya and Jason. You know, our hearts would just be breaking for them. And, and how, do you, how do you minister in that moment? You minister with the word of God, which gives hope. The word of God that says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The word of God that says, God, the God of compassion, the Father of comfort, will comfort you so that you can comfort one another with the comfort you yourselves have received. The word of God that says, I am the resurrection and life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. For he who believes in me will never die. It's the word of God that brings the comfort in those moments. It's the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me by still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. It's the word of God that touches hearts and comforts and blesses and gives us hope even in some of the darkest moments, in some of our most frightening times. It's the word of God that gives us hope. Well, there's another part of our text. Verse 14 says, You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displeased God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. And what Paul is challenging us to do is contrast the Thessalonians with the Jews. Now, he's using this general term, the Jews. Jesus was a Jew. You do know that, right? Paul was a Jew. Every one of the apostles were Jews. All of the first early believers were all Jews. So not all Jews didn't accept Jesus. In fact, all of the first Christians were Jews. And in many places, if you remember, what did Paul do? Where did Paul go? He would go to the Jewish synagogue when he went to a town because those people would have a sense of fearing of God. They would have an understanding of God. They weren't worshiping multiple gods. They were worshiping the singular God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so that's where they would go, to the synagogue. They would go to Jews in Thessalonica. Where did he go? The synagogue, who accepted Christ? Jews. So be careful, we're not trying to label all Jews as bad, okay? Just watch out for that. We're, we're, but, but take note that there were a significant number of Jews that did some pretty harsh and hostile things towards Jesus and the church. In fact, wasn't Paul one of them? Wasn't he chasing after Christians, arresting them, having them put in prison, having them killed? He, in fact, he's on his way to Damascus to arrest everyone he can find there that's a, that's a follower of the way. He is a persecutor. He's a Jew, and he was doing some pretty nasty things to Christians. The Jews killed Jesus. Paul didn't even say it. Not only did they kill Jesus, but they killed the prophets. That happened throughout history. They drove the apostles and the believers out of Judea. The Christian church spreads and disperses. We use the word dispersion like it's a fun thing. It, 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 it makes all, the Christians all start running into other places, and it actually causes the gospel to get spread around the world because Christians are getting away from Judea where persecution is being really intense. They actually tried to keep these Jewish Christians from sharing the gospel with the Gentiles. And that's actually happening there in Thessalonica. 
So they actually get, the Bible says, they get some rebel rousers to start a riot, to get everybody upset, to run off these followers of the way. But take note, even though this is happening, God's wrath is coming upon them. You see, we don't have to judge other people, do we? We don't have that responsibility, thank God. God takes care of his concerns like that. And God's wrath is coming upon them. And what will happen is, within a very short time, the temple will be destroyed, Jerusalem will burn, millions will be killed because the Jews had decided not to follow God. How did the, the, the Thessalonians follow the, the Judeans, as it says? Well, they were beaten, imprisoned, and persecuted because they believed in Jesus. Wow. Don't you wish that had happened to you when you were first be, as a Christian? Brand new Christian, three weeks old. You just accepted Jesus. You're still learning about what, what this is all about.